There are other, um, there are other methods that we can use to study black holes in the centers of nearby galaxies. In some galaxies, particularly in elliptical galaxies, just uh, sort of by chance, there happens to be a disk of gas that's in very nice circular rotation around the center of the galaxy, around the black hole. And if you can measure spectral lines coming from that disk, you would see that one part of the disk, one side of the disk is redshifted because it's rotating away from you. The other side of the disk is rotating towards you. And if you can measure the redshifts and blue shifts along different parts of this disk, say along a sort of a stripe going through the center of that disk, you can actually use that, apply John Mitchell's method that he came up with in the 1780s to use the orbits of material orbiting around the black hole to determine the mass of the black hole. And this is a method that I've worked on uh, since several years ago, and my group is continuing to work on using data from the Hubble Space Telescope. What you expect to see if you could measure the velocity of material in this disk orbiting the black hole is that on the redshifted side, you would see the velocities get larger and larger and larger as you go toward the center because the rotation is getting faster and faster and faster as you look closer and closer to the center. On the blue shifted side, you would see the same thing, except the velocities would be in the opposite direction, which is a negative velocity in this particular plot. So you'd see the velocities get faster and faster and faster in that disk as you go toward the center of the black hole. Now, in practice, there's always some sort of instrumental blurring that blurs this velocity signature into something that looks more like that in practice. And that's the typical signature of an orbiting disk around the black hole, if you could measure the velocity of the disk. And I can show you an example of work that's in progress by my group. Uh, my graduate student, Janelle Walsh, is working on this measurement right now for one particular giant elliptical galaxy where we use the Hubble Space Telescope to zoom in very, very closely to the center of that galaxy and measure the velocities of gas in this orbiting disk. And we see exactly that signature that we expected to find from material that's orbiting faster and faster and faster as you get closer and closer and closer to the very center. That's the sign that there is a very, very massive object at the very center of that disk. And in this particular case, although the work is still in progress, the, the result is coming out to be in this particular galaxy that this black hole has a likely mass that's in the range of about 500 to 700 million solar masses. So that's a pretty big black hole Certainly not the biggest by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a pretty big one. And what we've learned over the last decade, what astronomers have learned in the search for black holes, is that bigger galaxies tend to have bigger black holes. When you look at, but when we look at the few dozen black holes whose masses have been measured by these techniques, and compare the mass of the black hole to the properties of the host galaxy that, we li that the black hole lives in, what we find is that bigger galaxies have bigger black holes. And the mass of the black hole is very nicely proportional to the mass of that central bulge component of the host galaxy. It turns out that the mass of the black hole typically is about one-tenth of one percent of the mass of the bulge component of the host galaxy that it lives in. So in fact, the, the black hole is sort of a tiny speck in the middle of the galaxy. The black hole is not as massive as the whole galaxy as it lives in. It's not even, uh, it's not even close. It's only a tiny, tiny fraction of the total mass of a galaxy that's in the black hole. But there's a, a huge range of masses and a lot of questions that really remain to be answered. For example, we'd like to really understand what are the biggest black holes in the universe as well as the smallest. And my group has been very active in studying some of the smallest black holes that we can find in the universe because all of these big black holes got their start as small black holes that grew by accreting and swallowing up a lot of matter or even merging with other black holes. And if we want to understand the kinds of environments that these giant black holes here uh, got their start in, where they began, we need to look at the small black holes in a lot of detail. And right now, we don't know very much about the small black holes. And in fact, as you can see from this plot, for these kinds of measurements that are done with the Hubble Space Telescope, there are almost no measurements for black holes below 10 million solar masses. If, if we look down to the region of black holes with a, a million solar masses or 100,000 solar masses, we know almost nothing about the population of black holes that might exist in that mass range. But the total mass range here is quite large. In fact, there's a recent measurement by a group at the University of Texas that found in the galaxy uh, Messier 87 a mass of six billion solar masses for the black hole in that galaxy. For the smallest black holes that we can find in the smallest galaxies, this is a project that 
In fact, uh, my graduate student Carol Thornton has been working on here at UC Irvine studying the properties of very small dwarf galaxies that have some evidence of quasar-like activity going on in their nuclei. And based on her work, we have evidence for some very, very small galaxies that probably have black holes with masses as small as about 300,000 solar masses, which is extremely small for this family of supermassive black holes. But we really don't have very much data yet to, uh, to understand sort of the demographic properties of this class of very small black holes. So that's something that we're very interested in, uh, in learning more about in the future. 